towards the end of the 19th century, there is a, definitely an increase in uh, the Jewish population in the area. And um, that is significant. In 1880, um, some of the, the Jews in the area are uh, descendants of these Jews who'd lived in the area through the centuries. Others are recent in, um, immigrants, um, largely Orthodox Jews, um, and about two-thirds of them end up in Jerusalem. And at least one estimate is there are probably about 25 in 1880, somewhere around 25,000 uh, Jews there at that time. So a couple of um, uh, concluding comments here. First, um, there's no question in my mind as an historian that there is a consistent Jewish presence in what is modern-day Israel. Throughout all of this, there are Jews there, though the size of that population at times uh, diminishes and becomes very small. Secondly, over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and this stretches way back into the biblical material. Steve, in the interest of time, didn't talk about all of those folks who conquered who came marching through, but over and over again, there is outside occupation, outside uh, rule, outside attempts to control. And yet, and yet, that longing that Steve talked about so eloquently uh, persists, and that presence persists. That longing persists, and that presence persists. So what do we make of all that? Well, I think one of the things we make of it is it's left, left modern folk with a really complicated story. It's left modern folk with a really complicated situation. It's left us with, um, archaeologically speaking, a story that is all about layers. Layer after layer after layer. One empire after the other. Literally, literally, in many places, you can see the layers, the archaeological layers that reflect each of these various times of invasion, times of occupation. It is, it is at a crossroads, always has been, and that kind of invites that sort of outside behavior, if you will. What we're going to do next week, I'm going to turn this over to Steve here in a moment again, and then we'll open the floor. Um, but next week, we're going to focus in particular on the last uh, 150 years. We're going to take a look at the modern Zionist movement. Um, we're going to talk about things like the Balfour Declaration, uh, the creation of the modern state of Israel, and the current situation there. But you can't talk about all that stuff, I'm convinced, without thinking about the 3,500, 4,000 years that go before it. It's part of, uh, we, we Americans, um, and I think most of us in the room are Americans, there may be a few Canadians here, um, or otherwise, but we Americans have this really limited understanding of what history is. You know, we think, we think New England is old. You know? uh, we, we think that uh, Florida is, old in St. Augustine, you know. But the reality is history is deep and it holds and it informs and it shapes. You know, I wouldn't have devoted so much of my life to the study of history and the teaching of history if I didn't believe that. It's not just about what happened then, because what happened then brings us to where we are now. And where we are now 
in many ways is in kind of a mess. And that's probably understated. But it is a mess that I think is addressable if we bring to bear the sorts of things Steve was talking about earlier. If we recognize that it is okay to disagree so long as we're not disagreeable. And indeed, when we disagree, we often can come to points of agreement. But those only happen when we're willing to really listen uh, to one another. And part of listening to each other is paying attention to history. You know, it's another one of those maxims that we're not quite sure who originally said it. Um, which philosopher came up with the notion, but it's true, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And we see a lot of that in this story, history repeating itself over and over and over again. And one of the primary lessons I take out of this whole story is when somebody outside tries to rule, it fails. Rule has to be organic and come from within. Because that's what happens in this story. These outside rulers constantly fall. They constantly fall. Thank you, John. I, I think this is a wonderful presentation. I really have no points of digression except to, not even except, only would underscore that what was happening in the rest of the world to Jews in terms of the delegitimization, in terms of the persecution that was a part of the ebb and flow of history only intensified this messianic longing to which I referred and only made stronger this desire and this does come to a boil at the end of the 19th century and we'll discuss that next time. Um, questions, comments, rebuttals, we'll start here. I'd like to know how so many Jewish people wound up in Russia. How so many Jewish people wound up in Russia? Whew! <laughs> um, I would say very uh, quickly that, a, of course, a lot of Jews were in Eastern Europe, in Europe, and Poland in particular. Poland got sliced up a number of times, and Jews were then living in very great concentrations in the western part of what is now Russia into the, the pale of settlement, but the exile really created two main Jewish communities worldwide. Those that settled in Spain, Portugal, and Northern Africa were one, and the rest, when forced to flee, came to different parts of Europe, and particularly uh, Germany, Poland, and then by default, if you will, Russia. Best I can do. Tough question. Yes? Thank you. Um, Pastor Danner, uh, forgive my ignorance, but would you tell us um, uh, uh, any um, insight that you have as to uh, Jesus loving um, Jerusalem or, or thinking about Jerusalem and or Israel? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, Jesus was, as I think everybody here knows, you've heard me say it a zillion times, uh, Jesus was a good Jew. And as a good first century Jew, he loved Jerusalem. Um, he went to Jerusalem probably more frequently than the Gospels tell us about uh, because he would have um, followed the mandate to be in Jerusalem for the great festivals. Um, there is a, there's one passage where Jesus is said to be sitting outside Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city um, and he openly weeps for Jerusalem. Um, partly, it depends who's interpreting that particular passage, partly, no doubt, because of the, the mess that Jerusalem was in, because of the Romans at that period of time, 
And uh, some scholars would suggest that uh, Jesus, being the very insightful sort of person that he was, um, may have anticipated that a day was coming when Jerusalem would actually be uh, destroyed uh, by, the, by the Romans. There's one point where he talks about uh, the temple uh, being destroyed. And there are various ways of interpreting that passage, that particular passage, but I think it's one very legitimate way to interpret that, again, is to simply recognize that he was an astute observer and he, he realized that the time was going to come when the Romans were just plain going to come in and, and uh, squash everything, which of course, 35, 40 years after his death, uh, they do. So, um, Again, um, most everybody here has heard me say this before, um, but it's always worth repeating, um, and in, especially in anticipation of this trip for those who are going. Uh, Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus was a Jew. He never pretended to be anything but a Jew. And I think it's very fair to say um, Jesus had no intention of starting a new religion. He was, if you will, a reformer. He came, he saw things within his own faith community that he thought were, uh, were awry at the moment, and he wanted to bring about some reform. I, there's just no justification, historically or, or otherwise, as far as I'm concerned, and certainly not even theologically, uh, to, to claim a Jesus, as some people do, as the founder of Christianity. That's just not, that's not, uh, not what he did. Is Christianity built on the teachings as well as the life and death and resurrection of Jesus? Yes, that's certainly true, but it's not Jesus who creates that religious response to his teaching and to his life. So I don't know if that helps or not, but yeah. Always important to bear that in mind. As far as I'm concerned, you, you miss, whether you're a Christian or a Jew or otherwise, it's important to bear that in mind because I think you miss the whole story if you don't remember Jesus was always, from birth to death, a Jew. Always. Yeah. What is the earliest Leah. historic archaeological evidence for the existence of Jews in Palestine? Is this thing from the. What's the question? What is the, I don't know the answer, Steve, might the earliest archaeological evidence of Jews in Palestine or Israel? I believe it would be the discovery of Solomon's copper mines, um, but I think that some of the uh, artifacts that have been found with inscriptions with the name of David on them have also uh, given credence to that. But when the, the first actual discovery was not being an archaeologist, I, I think that there are people who can answer that much better than I, and our guides in Israel will be able to give you chapters and verse, and for those who are going, you'll hear them. For those who aren't, we'll be happy to bring that back. But that's, that's also pretty Googleable. but I don't have a better answer at hand. Google-able. Google 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 I just made up I a new word. I think you made up a new word. <laughs> Google-able. <laughs> yeah, Vicki. So I just have a comment. First of all, I think it's amazing that the two of you brought so much history so quickly. Uh, I, I tried writing it down on my, on my notes here, and, and my finger wasn't quite fast enough. But um, many years ago when I w went to Israel, a book that was recommended to me was The Source by James Mishner, oh, yeah. which has a lot of information and sort of a, a, a fun way to read about the history. And if anybody hasn't read it or wants to reread it, you're going to be on the plane for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a good book to bring along. Great. Thanks, Vicki. Yeah. Yes, Bob. Yeah, Pastor, can you comment on the flow of other people? So what we've done so far is talk about Jews in the Holy Land, uh, going back to Abraham and on through. Uh, 
who were the other people who were flowing in? Not not the conquerors necessarily, but the people who inhabited, who might have a claim to that territory. There's a question, please. Okay, uh, who who were the other people flowing in and out of that area who might have a claim to the territory? Is the way the question was phrased. Um, well, I'll answer it, and then I'll have Steve answer it as well. Certainly, um, one of the things that uh, we Western Christians tend to forget is that there was a, a Christian presence um, pretty much right from the get-go that also remains there to this day. Um, Christians who were there and descendants of the same are there now. Um, we tend to think of uh, Christianity primarily as being um, uh, Roman Catholic or Protestant in expression, but the reality is we leave out, those of us in the West, we tend to leave out the whole Eastern Orthodox Church, churches more accurately. And there, the, those uh, folk were and are present uh, to this day. Um, certainly, uh, from the seventh century forward, there are Muslims in and out of, of the area, uh, depending on the, the flow of things, but there certainly are Muslims present um, throughout the period and, and continue to be present as well. Uh, one of the things I don't think either of us really said was um, uh, that Jerusalem in particular and Israel in general um, is enormously significant uh, for all three of, of these uh, Abrahamic faith uh, traditions, uh, often called the, the Abrahamic faiths because all claiming uh, in one way or another to descend from Abraham, who Steve talked about. It's part of what binds us together. Um, another piece that binds us together is um, the fact that we're often also called people of the book, um, it's not the same book, uh, so that's a little misleading. People of the books might be more accurate, but all three of these Western traditions are textually based. Um, for Jews, the Hebrew scriptures, um, as well as the Talmud. Um, uh, for uh, Christians, the Hebrew scriptures and um, what is called the New Testament or the Greek scriptures. And for Muslims, uh, the Koran. Uh, but if you were to read the Koran, and this obviously is not a presentation on Islam, but if you were to read the Koran, you would be amazed at the number of stories that as a Jew you would recognize or as a Christian that you would recognize. Maybe told somewhat differently, often told somewhat differently, but um, whether or not there's direct Jewish and Christian influence on Muhammad is really up for grabs but there are scholars who feel that there is, and certainly he was exposed uh, to Jews and Christians because they were present in uh, Mecca and Medina at that uh, seventh century period of time. I would just ask, do you include the Armenians in that Eastern Orthodox? Yes, okay. yes, yeah. Then I don't have anything to add. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. I see this as being recorded. When uh, can we have access to another presentation from the recording, or will we? Good question. Let's see how it comes out and what I can do with it. <laughs> oh, this is kind of an experiment. I, I thank Rabbi and Pastor for letting us do this. I haven't done this in about five years, so I'll have a much better idea after I go home and look at it. Um, so, so if either of us have bunny ears or something, well, no, somebody got it, your digital material, yes. <laughs> yes. I just want to thank you both. I think the presentation is super. Fabulous. See you next week. See you next week. Uh, same time, same place. We'll see that there are more chairs and more handouts. And probably I expect more questions. Thank you very much. That was very good. Good. I really did. I think